2016 Longmont City Council study session to order. Could we please start with the roll call? Mayor Coombs? Here. Council members Bagley? Christensen? Finley? Here. Moore? Here. Peck? Here. Santos? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum? Okay, let's stand for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So if we have no motions from council to uh, direct the city manager to add a agenda items to the future, I'll go ahead and start with uh, public invited to be heard. The first person on the list is Abby Driscoll, so please come down and state your name and address. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Abby Driscoll. I live at 1673 Geneva Circle. And I was recently elected the chair of the board of for Sustainable Resilient Longmont. It's a non, not local nonprofit grassroots group. Um, we have some people here tonight who have showed up to represent the rest of Longmont um, who care about sustainability issues. So for everyone who's here for sustainability, stand up and show your support. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> hope that's okay. We're, we won't get you out of order. Yeah. Um, we just really are here to thank you for commissioning the City of Longmont Sustainability Plan. Thank you for the time and resources and effort that went into formulating the plan. Um, sustainability encompasses a, a broad set of issues, clean air, water, sensible transportation policy, energy con conservation, and sustainable agriculture are imperative to our quality of life and economic future. These issues matter to me as a mom. I want my son and future generations to be able to enjoy our environment and natural resources as he grows up. So others have really prepared a more well thought out statement, but I really just wanted to emphasize that we appreciate your um, work on this plan and would like to work in concert with you as it moves forward. Um, so we are in full support of the council passing the sustainability plan. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Uh East Fet. I probably butchered that, but you can correct me. Good evening, Mayor Coombs and Council members. My name is Erin Eastvet, and I live at 2227 Creekside Drive here in Longmont. Um, I'm also an advisor to Sustainable Resilient Longmont. Um, I'm 31 years old, so I'm very concerned about creating a healthier. Uh, planet both for uh, my generation and the generation to come uh, that will come after me. Um, as both a resident and, sorry, um, as both, a, um, so I'm just here to thank you guys for um, the work you've done on the sustainability plan up to this point. Um, as both a resident and a business owner here in Longmont, um, I'm proud to live and work in a city that cares about the future of our planet. So thank you again for your work on the sustainability plan and for your time and attention. Thank you. Kendra Appleman Eastvet. Good evening, Mayor Coombs and mm. council members. I'd like to start by just thanking you for sponsoring the current draft of the city sustainability plan and of course for giving us an opportunity to speak during the study session. Um, I'm a Longmont resident. I also live at 2227 Creekside Drive. And I'm a board member of Sustainable Resilient Longmont. There's a number of reasons that I support the city's move to a more sustainable future. Um, in fact, for me recently, as a non-traditional student, I went back to school to get my master's degree. In the CSU Poli Sci graduate program, I studied environmental policy, and I focused my graduate professional, my graduate professional research on sustainable American cities. In a very small nutshell, here's some of the things I learned. Um, to begin with, sustainability goes beyond environmentalism. Back in 1987, the Brundtland Commission first introduced the world to sustainable development as a path toward growth and expansion that meets our current needs without compromising the needs of future generations. 
Since that time, this definition has evolved into a paradigm that sometimes is called the three pillars, the three E's, triple bottom line, or three-legged stool. All of sustainability and all of these comprised of an intergenerational concern for environmental stewardship, economic vitality, and social equity. Tonight, I'm happy to point out that I believe the current draft of the city's plan embraces all three of these very important aspects. This type of comprehensive plan is also important for Longmont to remain competitive since neighboring cities like Boulder and Fort Collins are already way ahead of us in this respect. Also, some unlikely American cities are embracing sustainability, further increasing the need for Longmont to move forward. For example, cities like Dubuque, Iowa and Durham, North Carolina were recognized for their efforts in a 2014 ICMA um, report alongside Fort Collins. With cities across the U.S. embracing sustainability, Longmont's adoption and implementation of a comprehensive plan becomes an ever more critical part of a competitive economy that attracts businesses and creates jobs. Importantly, jobs and income are required to increase the city's tax base and improve standards of living. As a result of implement, implementation of the effective sustainability plan, our residents would be able to infuse the city with dollars in forms of taxes and disposable income, creating robust economic and social benefits. For these reasons and many more, I support the city's plan and I encourage you to continue to press forward to create a truly sustainable Longmont. In fact, I would argue that our city's future depends upon it. Thank you. Thank you. Bridget Schaff. Shaf Nessie. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Bridget Shaughnessy. I live at 817 Sanctuary Circle. I am the gifted and talented teacher at Central Elementary, where I have taught various grades for the last 18 years. Um, our school and our town is near and dear to my heart. As part of a larger unit on communities, my small group of first graders created walking tours of Central, of Old Town, Longmont, and of Thompson Park. When my small group researched Thompson Park's history, we found some very fascinating information about the park's namesake. And one of my students, Mike and Palmer, is here tonight to give you information and has a request of the city. I'm going to let her speak now. We're going to go over here in just a second. And um, to share with you the information and request. Thank you for your time. I'm also going to invite the other students from Central Elementary to come up and stand near her, but I'm going to let her do the speaking. Good evening, City. Wait. Good evening, Longmont City Council members. My name is Mike and Palmer, and my address is 725 Bone Street, and I am a first grader at Central Elementary School. I am here to talk about something that is really, really important to me, Thompson Park. At school, I've been learning about Elizabeth Thompson, who the park is named after. Did you know that the mayor in 1890 rented Thompson Park for $14 a month to have, his, to have a place for his cows to eat? She bought the first... 300 books for Library Hall. She was a philanthropist who used her money to buy 20 land plots for people who needed a place to live. Did you know that I picked out a tree in Thompson Park to keep and take care of? It is number 27, and, is a, and it is a sequoia. I like to call it Zeke It is right next to the gazebo where there is art in public places, plaques right now about the history of Longmont. There is even something about pumpkin pie days. The tree is a bit little, but I know it will grow to be big and strong. My group and I walked around to see the trees, but we noticed there was nothing but Elizabeth Thompson. So tonight, I'm here to ask you if the city council could place something in the park to honor her. Thank you for your time. Wow. Well done. <laughs> so I, I guess... Um, I'm going to interrupt a, a little bit. Uh, can we get consensus from the council to support this at this time? Is this yeah. Could someone? Uh, could you like send us the um, plaque and then and then we'll we can approve it then. Thank you so much for being here. And 
My kid did an excellent job reading. <laughs> so now, James Johnson. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is James Johnston. I live here in Longmont, for now anyway. We've been still trying to find a house, can't find one. I have been here for 65 years. I have volunteered for the police department as a chaplain. I was a chaplain at the Longmont Hospital for over 30 years. And I have volunteered for the Housing Authority and so on, several of the things to, in here. And I am at a point now where my health has gone downhill a little bit. So I had to quit working when I really wanted to. I said, I'm not old yet. I won't be old till I'm 105. Mm -hmm. But uh, the kids tell me, well, you're getting older. And yes, I'm getting older. But I know that there is a place there for us, and we don't want a handout. We want something we can pay for. And we have money, but just not very much. And so I would like somebody, we've talked to several realtors. They're trying their best to help us. And if somebody has an idea, I would sure appreciate it if they'd tell us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Georgetta Johnston. Good evening, Mayor and Councilman. And uh, I'm in Longmont. And... This is a wonderful city, and we, like you said, we've been checking still yet on housing, and uh, we're talking with you people, too, because you're over the city, and I'm sure it's going to come down where it'll work out for us. We've been doing, there isn't nothing that we haven't done. We've checked uh, with all different situations, so we came again to remind you and to show you that we're looking, and there's got to be affordable housing for us, and uh, this is a wonderful city, and it was wonderful hearing all these people here about the town because we've been here for many, many years ourselves. We just celebrated 54 years of marriage October 14th, so that's a miracle. <laughs> Not a lot of people do that. It's an honor, but my husband and I both have volunteered a lot in this city, so we're we're coming to tell you, I'm sure if you can be looking to the same as us, and I'm sure something's going to come out because it's a wonderful city, and, and it should be affordable for all of us to live, and we don't want to be somebody uh, doing it for us. We want to do our part. So thank you very much for letting me talk, and you keep doing a wonderful job, and Lord bless you. Thank you. And my grandson, my great-grandson, uh, I think it's... Is it Zachariah or Noah? Which one? Okay, Noah. Noah's going to talk. Okay, hey, Noah. Talk Noah Sanchez. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Noah. My grandparents need a house with a yard, at least a garage, two bed, two bath. They have been living with relatives in any motel. I came to you because you are over the city and my grandparents need a house. Thank you so much, City Council and Mr. Mayor. Have a nice night and take care. Thank you. Zach Sanchez. I'm here to talk about my grandpa just like my brother. He was hurt during his time in the post office and everything. But he has done so much for his community and the city of Longmont. And he really needs a house right now. He's staying with us, but it's not really to his needs. And he really, right, like he said he has money, but he doesn't have a lot. And he just is such a nice guy. I don't even know how to express it. It's just sad for me. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Tracy Howard. Good evening, Mayor, members of council. My name is Tracy Howard, 2131 Steel Street. I'm vice chair of Sustainable Resilient Longmont, and I just wanted to thank you guys again for 
putting together uh, with staff and implementing the sustainability plan and I look forward to seeing how that pans out in the future and I also wanted to say I'm not really sure who is the ultimate person but whoever's decision it was where he is to, <laughs> to hire David Bell, the Natural Resources Department. Yes, mm -hmm. and please, please, please keep Lisa permanent, full time, forever. <laughs> um, there was something. Oh yes, Joan Gregerson. Most of you may know or remember Joan Gregerson. She founded Sustainable Resilient Longmont when it was still a revolution. <laughs> Well, she wanted to be here tonight to thank you all in person as well because the sustainability plan is near and dear to her heart. I got a text from her. She's in Denver now. She's living there, doing well, but she said, save me a seat. Then half hour later, I got a text that said, hmm, shit, I missed my bus. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, she said, well, I'll be with you all in spirit. So Joan says thank you and hello to everybody. Kay Fissinger. Kay Fissinger, 2199 Creekside Drive, Longmont. I'm here to, again, talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, as it is to all the people in Longmont, and that's oil and gas drilling and fracking within the city of Longmont. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Council Member uh, Christensen, for sticking up for us last, at the last meeting, I think it was, and asking for the subject to be brought forward in a public session so that we know what's going on. We are all entitled to that. When I looked back at the, um, the, the announcement of the executive session and, and read it closely, it appears, well, my assumption is from what I read, that the agreements with top operating may be undergoing some new negotiations. Um, I, I think the public needs to know at this point in time what those negotiations have to do with. Are we allowing them more latitude? Are we trying to get some additional benefit out of that? Uh, we need to know. Um, I also want to bring to your attention that um, as of a conversation that I had uh, earlier this evening, uh, the top operating still does not have their state permit. It has been on hold since, I believe it was 2013. Uh, it's incomplete. Uh, there have been overtures to the COGC and to the director to reopen that permit, or at the very least, oh, um, uh, to, or to start over with it altogether. Um, I think that's appropriate. There have been a lot of changes at the state level. There's been a lot of new information out onto, as far as the health and safety aspects and the general welfare aspects of oil and gas drilling. So, um, and I also understand that the city of Longmont is not able to issue a permit to top operating until the state has completed its work. So I would ask you to, uh, to support the effort to reopen state hearings on a permit, a state permit, and also to come forward as soon as possible and tell us those portions of the executive session that have to do with areas other than legal advice or anything sensitive as far as your negotiations. I'm sure there were things that were spoken about in executive session that are factual that we could know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Karen Dyke. Mayor and council people. My name's Karen Dyke. I live in at, uh, 708 Hayden Court. I'm here tonight as part of the board of Our Health, Our Future, Our Longmont. Tonight I want to express the concern of residents of this city regarding the negotiations occurring with oil and gas operations. Residents are rightly concerned that fracking is once again threatening our families, homes, and community. We are alarmed to learn that closed door negotiations are occurring. To also learn that this city council is so sure that we will be bombarding with fracking that they are planning to hire someone to handle the contracts is horrifying. Citizens deserve to know what is being negotiated. Residents of Longmont are expecting you, our elected city officials, to stand up for the health and safety of all of us. 
Learning about the plans for fracking drove us to explore the current regulations written in 2012. We find that the regs fail to address improvements in the COGCC and ACQC regs enacted since 2012. It would be irresponsible for this council to proceed with negotiations without a thorough review. I brought with me a prepared statement for this council and supporting documents detailing our review of the regs. I printed out copies for each of you to have uh, detailing our review of those regs and where they fail to meet even minimum current standards. Here is our statement. Demands from the residents of Longmont. The residents of Longmont hereby demand that the Longmont City Council act decisively to protect their health, safety, community, and homes from the destructive incursion of fracking into the city limits. The current Longmont City regulations were written in 2012 and no longer reflect even the minimal setbacks required by the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Committee. Commission. They don't reflect Air Quality Control Commission regulations written in 2014. Also since 2012, hundreds of peer-reviewed articles revealing detrimental effects of fracking on human health and safety have been published. Based on these facts, we are calling on you to enact at least a one-year moratorium of all fracking within the city limits. During that time period, the city council must appoint Longmont citizens to work with the council and city staff to rewrite the city regulations pertaining to fracking. The attached documents details of missions and weaknesses of the current regulations. A moratorium will provide time to develop regulations that would more adequately protect Longmont residents. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Smotspire. Good evening, Mayor Coombs and Council. Uh, Mike Schnatzmeyer, 12001 Twilight Street, Longmont. Um, I also am a member of Sustainable Resilient Longmont, and I would like to thank you for your consideration and support of the sustainability plan. The plan is about more than the environment, or clean air, or clean water. It is critical to having a vital and flourishing economy to have quality jobs and affordable housing. The sustainability plan reflects the values and mindset of the millennial generation and younger generations and the startup businesses that create jobs and are the drivers of the digital economy. If we want to be competitive in the front range region, it's critical that we have the sustainability plan in order to attract this mindset for this type of job creation. The plan is about having a bigger vision for Longmont, for smart growth, for food security, for a transportation system that makes Longmont walkable and bikeable. A walkable, bikeable city makes housing and living affordable. If you, again, I've said this before, if you don't have to have a car in order to just survive, you free up $9,000 of your annual budget to make housing education, healthcare more affordable. So again, thank you for your support of the plan. It's a great start, start, start. It's important to continue to build upon this humble beginning. Thank you. Thank you. And the low men. Good evening, Mayor Coombs and Council Members. Can we pull the mic Edna down? Bowman. Oh, yes, I forgot I'm only five something. <laughs> My name is Edna Lohman. I live at 1314 Grant Street in Longmont. Uh, I've almost been here 10 years now. Uh, next year will be my 10th year, and I just really enjoy living here so much. The city has so much to offer, and really, I like it better than any uh, place I've ever been. So. And so I'm very interested to keep it that way. Um, I, so I want to thank you and also congratulate Lisa Noblock, uh, Carl Youngberg, and Dale Rodemaker, and other city staff involved in the development of Longmont's sustainability plan. 
Uh, I also want to thank leaders of SRL and members of the Bureau of Environmental Affairs, uh, the committee from the city that's been involved with the sustainability plan. Um, so uh, as a board member of SRL, I am proud of this planning document and I urge you to support its fruition. I watched and participated in the process that evolved the plan. It involved a lot of different community members. Uh, I admire the, uh, the methods that Lisa employed to get this involvement and the support of the community. This plan truly represents the character and desires of Longmont residents for a resilient and successful future in terms of both the natural environment, the economy, the community, waste, energy, food, security, and the other five aspects of the plan. I particularly appreciate that the plan has both strategies and measurable outcomes for each of the areas of emphasis together with a detailed timetable. This is the approach that our citizens called for and it has been accomplished in the form of this readable and attractive <laughs> planning document. It's more attractive than any other one I've seen so far. I've, I've looked at several. Now in addition to calling for your acceptance and support of this plan, I ask also for the support to accomplish the plan for the coming years. Planning resources and a planning coordinator will be needed for this purpose. I'd like to see not only this lovely document, but also an ongoing vibrant process to see it through. The participation of citizens, government, and business leaders will be needed to achieve the aspirations of our plan. Some education, grant money, and community organization with uh, involvement of business and citizen groups will be needed to get the buy-in and enthousi enthusiastic involvement of citizens and business with government to make the plan a reality. In addition to accepting Longmont's sustainability plan, our city government has an important role to facilitate such efforts with city resources. Thank you for your support of this plan and its implementation for our sustainable and resilient future. Thank you. Thank you. Dale Lannon. Hello. Uh, Dale Lannon, 1018 Ponderosa Circle. Um, I really love our city and I, I want a future for our kids way so. Um, I believe that our world is um, on a fast track to an extinction event that won't allow a seventh uh, rate extinction. We have a problem, the rate at which we're dumping carbon dioxide at over three parts per million per year is the fastest in geologic history that I know of, the entire geologic history of Earth. That means that you can project, you could assume that we would experience a, um, an extinction event in excess of, of the others. I want um, our city to th thrive. I want, I want to, to lead. I want a future for our kids. Our, our situation is that thermodynamics and heat, tran uh, heat transfer, we, have, we use a monetary um, basis of, uh, of, of exchange. The monetary conversion is a system isolation at physics forcing entropy rise, a rise of the inability to create work from usable energy. I don't want our, our world, I don't want our city tied up in knots of inadequate um, project uh, um, um, plans that we want to add to with incremental um, bits of, of change. We need to make a fundamental root core change to of our life, of our, the way we work, the way our city functions so that we can be going in the right direction so that from that point forward we can have quality improvement stick and really have a zoom that could perhaps out accelerate the forces that try to compete for the other side. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Brian Cope Pum.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Brian Copham, 1221 Carolina Avenue, Longmont 80501, and I'm also the Chair of the Board of Environmental Affairs. On behalf of the Board, we ask that you uh, adopt and support the plan that has been put forth by your staff. We've had the opportunity to meet with your staff, to review the plan drafts as they've come out, to comment on them, and we find the the document and the plan to be very comprehensive. We find it to have a good base of accountability. The process of developing it did involve multiple public input sessions as well as meetings with key stakeholders and in my other life I work in the agricultural community so we were invited to do that as well as I saw many of the other groups. The plan is very well developed and we think it's essential to Longmont. It will help protect and enhance the quality of life. We see that these plans are increasingly being adopted by municipalities and that as many of the other uh, speakers mentioned, they become a vital component to economic development because organizations that are seeking to establish campuses, new locations, headquarters, are looking for these kinds of plans to know that they are contributing to a community that is managing its resources well and in alignment with their own missions. We also encourage you to have a full-time sustainability coordinator. It will be essential to the successful implementation of the plan. And we think that the work that was done uh, was is very, very well done. Uh, so thank you for the support in doing that. We ask that you contribute ongoing support and adopt the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that ends uh, public invited to be heard. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I haven't been here for a while. Uh, Strider Benston, 951 17th Avenue. Um, let us um, be aware, I know we're not supposed to talk broad politics, but this is a political year, as everybody probably knows. And I can only quote Jim Hightower, if God meant us to have elections, he would have given us candidates. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I do want to mention we have Bob C., uh, who is a school teacher from the Eastern Plains, and he does uh, take a role in climate change and in cities having the right to protect ourselves from the poisons that, uh, that surround us. Um, I just want to mention, I, uh, I have not read this plan, but I'm really pleased of the work that's been put in on it. And I recall about 10 years ago, we had a sustainability fair out at uh, um, Skyline High School, which is about the best event that Longmont has ever had. And we got a lot of groups going, but the city kind of lost touch in, in uh, uh, sustaining our sustainability. And many of us uh, here have been involved in active agriculture, uh, to protect us from uh, fracking, various other things like that for all of these years. And I'm really happy to see that the council is now looking into this seriously. And I hope you will give it all of the uh, all of the effort uh, that it requires. And I certainly agree with Dale Lanning that uh, the life on our planet is at stake. If we cannot reverse this rise in greenhouse gases, then um, uh, advanced life on this planet is doomed. It is up to us, and as long as we have time, we must make our effort. Um, despair is not an option, um, you know, and uh, hope requires our efforts, not just sitting back and, and uh, wishing it. Thank you much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at Public Invited to be Heard? 
Okay, I'll now close public invited to be here. Mayor, there are no special reports or presentations. So the first study session item is the discussion of the sustainability plan update. Dale Rademacher is at the podium. Uh, Mayor Cones and members of council, I'm Dale Rademacher. I'm the general manager of Public Works and Natural Resources. <clears throat> As you've uh, heard uh, or through the uh, public invited to be heard tonight, we are here tonight to present to you the draft uh, sustainability plan. We're, we're happy we're finally here with it. Um, we started this effort uh, uh, back in 2015. You gave us direction to get underway with it. We last updated you in June of this year and got some of your feedback and thoughts and comments on it. Uh, since then, I know Lisa and Cal have continued to work on developing the plan with the uh, the help and participation of uh, literally hundreds of uh, folks throughout the community. So I, I have to say this has probably been one of the more uh, sort of robust uh, plan planning efforts that we put together. It's certainly one of the broadest ones. Um, I, I think the, the whole issue and idea of sustainability is one that is uh, important to uh, essentially everyone. Uh, albeit somewhat different for everyone. I think everybody can, can find different value in sustainability and why that's something we need to be not only concerned about, but also need to be uh, trying to work towards um, you know, a, a stronger future and more resilient community. Uh, community. Also want to, uh, I want to give Cal some, some thanks here. He's, he's really been on this for the long haul and I think he's done a great job, but um, Truly, uh, Lisa has been the face of this effort, and uh, as a uh, temporary employee, I think she's done a commendable job. And um, I'm going to turn it over to her to uh, present the work that she's done. Well, Mayor Coombs and City Council members, thank you so much for having us here tonight. We're excited to discuss the plan with you and get your feedback. Um, uh, you've all been sent the draft of the sustainability plan as it is, as well as a summary for, for ease of read. I know it's quite a long document. There's, there's quite a bit of information in there. Uh, we're going to go through it tonight. We're going to try to keep it at a pretty high level on the objectives and targets, but feel free to ask any questions um, as we go through. And as I said, we're looking for your feedback and comments that we'll incorporate into a final uh, draft of the plan that we'll bring back hopefully in, in November for adoption. So I'm going to hand it over to Cal for just a couple minutes to do some background information. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Cal Youngberg, Environmental Services Manager, Public Works and Natural Resources. Um, thanks for having us here and be able to go through the plan with you. Um, I'm going to do some tag teaming with Lisa as we go through this, so you won't get bored with me or, or her, hopefully. We also have a representative of our consultant, Brendel Group, here, uh, Shelby Summer, and she's also here to help out if necessary. Um, just a project, quick project overview, a reminder. Um, we came to you in 2010 with a draft sustainability plan. It's been a long time ago. Uh, we kind of got put on hold, and then we were redirected to start it up again in 2015 uh, by council, and we've done that. Um, one of the things we really did was align it with Envision Longmont because that comprehensive plan update was happening at the same time. So we made a big effort to make sure we were in line with that. Um, our plan includes um, detailed sustainability objectives, targets, um, activities, which called strategies, and timelines for achieving those strategies. Uh, we also got $30,000 in grants from Boulder County to help develop this plan. Um, they gave us uh, some dollars to put together both the plan itself and also some of the outreach and communication strategies involved with the plan. So I guess we'll go to the next one. So as far as the connections with Envision, uh, like I said, we really tried to do that. Envision is really kind of the overreaching document for the city. It's a big planning document that puts out guiding principles, goals. Um, what the sustainability plan does is build on those, and we're using the sustainability topics, which are pretty common to plan sustainability plans uh, throughout the country right now, and actually build on what we did in 2010 that are related to Envision Longmont. And so you can actually link um, many of the guiding principles in Envision Longmont directly to the sustainability topics that we have in our plan. The Envision Longmont also promotes a sustainable and resilient Longmont. 
Um, and one of the strategies in, in Vision Longmont is in Guiding Principles 5, which is under responsible stewardship of our resources actually recommends that the city adopt a sustainability plan. So again, we're in kind of in sync with each other in that respect. And this is the plan that the, that the, the Envision document recommends. Um, these 10 topics are pretty common. Um, they kind of, you'll kind of go through them over the next while. We'll, we're we're going to walk through at a relatively high level uh, in each one of them and just kind of show you in detail only one so you can see the relationship between the topics and the strategies. Um, so we'll get to that when we get there. But um, the next slide is link, the links to Envision Longmont. Uh, at the beginning of each chapter in our plan, as you may have noticed if you've looked at it, is we do have a specific linkage to Envision Longmont where we do talk about the guiding principles that are in that plan and how they relate to this plan. Um, that further emphasizes the relationship between the two documents. The differences, uh, there are some differences. The Envision Longmont plan is a long-term, big picture type of document. Uh, promotes guiding principles and goals. It has general policy guidance and land use. Um, the sustainability plan, on the other hand, is more of an implementation plan. It really is talking about how we get to these goals and how we realize our objectives. What it does is, is look at the topics that are sustainability topics and, and provide strategies that we can enact to try to meet the goals and the objectives. Um, as, we went, as we worked on this, we worked hard with staff across the various departments uh, to develop these targets and strategies, and our hope is that other areas of the city will adopt and work with some, with some of these strategies as we go on. Uh, clearly, we have links with the planning group because of the Envision linkage. Um, there are other areas in the city that we also would like to work with um, to try and get some of these um, sustainability topics and subjects um, accomplished. Uh, I should note that the, the city um, topics that we talk about that have city-oriented city strategies in them, many of them are things that we're working on already. Um, they are underway or they are projects that we have worked are working on or are already budgeted. Uh, where we talk about community or business-oriented topics or strategies, those are really uh, oriented around voluntary and incentive programs. Uh, they're not mandates. We're not talking about mandating anything in this plan. We're talking about working with the different communities to try and either incentivize or get voluntary buy-in to them. Also, we're talking about a lot of it, as Lisa will cover a little later, we're talking about getting neighborhood groups as much as possible to help and work on these things on a neighborhood level to try and assist with this. So on a big picture, another big picture area, defining sustainability, you probably all have seen this. As somebody in the uh, public waiting to be heard uh, mentioned, it's the Brundtland definition of sustainability. It's kind of the big picture one. There's lots of de definitions of sustainability out there, depending on what area you're working in. But this was one of the originals and kind of still encompasses the basic idea of sustainability. Um, what we did in the plan was we really tried to look at um, what areas and what topics go across the triple bottom line of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social. So we tried to show graphically, as you can see in this chart and it's as shown in the plan, um, is where each of these topic areas lands in, in those three areas of the triple bottom line. Sustainability topics cross all those areas of the triple bottom line. Every one of them has some impact in each of those areas, and so you have to realize that they're interconnected. And in order to get strategies accomplished in these areas, you have to understand that there's multiple things that need to be done in the different areas, both social, economic, and environmental. Um, one method we had developed to try and help um, look at this triple bottom line aspect was the sustainability evaluation system that I presented to you guys at your retreat. And we have been working on that and trying to complete that this year so that we can actually apply that and use a more, if you want to say, sub objective look at sustainability topics to see how they meet the triple bottom line. And we're hoping to use that as an evaluation method as we get into this, into this plan more. Um, anyway, I think that's the kind of the summary at that, at, at, to this point. Um, Lisa is going to kind of go, out how we, go into how we developed the plan and the stakeholder outreach that we did. Um, so as a lot of people have mentioned, we've gone through a pretty extensive public outreach process to gather input from a wide variety of stakeholders. Um, I know there was some concern the last time we came to council about ensuring that we had a broad, um, a broad cross section of the community that we are getting input from. So I just wanted to highlight that everything, everything that's been done from a stakeholder outreach perspective. So we did hold three public workshops. Uh, we attended eight community events in which we talked face-to-face -face with people about the sustainability plan to understand um, priorities around sustainability. Uh, we gathered over 120 online surveys in English and Spanish, um, had numerous conversations uh, with folks, had 17 interviews and focus groups with a number of different people. 
Um, we had 25 members of the Sustainability Advisory Committee, uh, which represented both city staff and key community stakeholders and community residents, and 15 presentations to, to different boards and community groups. Uh, we also have our sustainability webpage that we've been posting information and keeping people updated, <laughs> information in City Line, City Talk. Information went out in the June utility bill, um, social media, and the, the Times call. I had a quick question. Councilmember Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Who, who chose who was on the 25-person advisory committee, and is there a list of who those people were that we could read? Uh, yeah, well, here's a, a, a list of the, the groups that were represented, and at the, at the on the front back of the first page of the sustainability plan lists all of those members. There was members. a list? Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Yes. Yeah, and that we recruited those folks based on um, people that were involved in the previous sustainability plan efforts, uh, folks from a number of different uh, city departments that have some connection to sustainability topics, interested community residents, and then we did our best to reach out to a number of key community stakeholders to engage them as well. A lot of folks that weren't available to participate in the Sustainability Advisory Committee, we stood, still went out and did discussions and presentations with folks to keep people, um, to get people's perspective and then also keep people in the loop in the development of the plan. Um, so, so we have representatives from all these different uh, departments, boards, commissions, groups, um, everyone from the Board of Environmental Affairs, as you heard from earlier, Front Range Community College, uh, Longmont Economic Development Partnership, EcoCycle, Youth Council, St. Rain Valley School District, a number of different people there. Uh, we had three advisory committee meetings throughout the development of this plan uh, to guide the development of the plan, and then those folks have been kept in the loop to weigh in on, on the different drafts and provide comments and feedback. Um, in addition, we met with um, a number of city staff in other departments as well, public safety, community services, planning and development services, um, PWNR obviously, city attorney's office, city manager's office, code enforcement, external services, and human resources. Um, and we did a number of different group discussions and presentations with groups um, that are all listed here, everybody from Boca Strong to Casa Esperanza, uh, Longmont Meals on Wheels, Longmont United Hospital, the Senior Citizens Advisory Board. Um, so really trying to get a cross-section of, of input on the plan. So um, all that we had collectively came up with our, Longmont, the, our vision for a sustainable Longmont, uh, which is an engaged community that promotes environmental stewardship, economic vitality, and social equity to create a sustainable and thriving future for all. Uh, the key components in our vision are the triple bottom line elements that Cal was mentioning earlier. In addition, this aspect of, of having an engaged community was really important to the stakeholders that we are working with. People, uh, this idea of involvement and inclusion came up over and over again, um, and really making sure that we are engaging the community in this process, and we are looking forward to uh, working with the community and the community group on the implementation side of things as well. And then we really think having an engaged community is a vital component to creating a sustainable community um, that represents everyone in our community. Um, in addition, we uh, received some grant money, as Cal mentioned, from Boulder County to do some outreach and marketing and communications around the development of the plan itself, and then when we get into the implementation phase. Uh, part of those funds were used to develop a, a logo and tagline, which you see here. Uh, which really encompasses that idea of working together as a community to uh, create, um, I'm going to say community a thousand times, but <laughs> to create a, a sustainable Longmont, um, not only today, but into the future, and really rec um, representing that, that definition that Cal was talking about. So not only looking at meeting the needs of the population that we have today, but looking to make sure that future generations also can have the ability to meet their needs as well. I'm going to have it, hand it back over to Cal for a minute, and he's going to jump into our topics. And I have to say that uh, with the amount of outreach that we took and, and input we got from all these various groups, we got some great ideas, and I also learned a lot about things that they have been thinking about in the realm of sustainability in their areas, uh, including in our city departments, that there are various people had ideas that have been running around in their heads, and they came out as we interviewed them and, and talked to them. So those things were incorporated into the plan as we went ahead. 
Um, anyway, we had 10 topics. Is that right? Yeah, 10 topics in our sustainability plan. Um, the topics are basically air quality, buildings and infrastructure, community cohesion and resilience, economic vitality, energy, food systems, natural environment, transportation, waste and water. Those are all components that reflect the triple bottom line and are pretty common to sustainability plans no matter where you go. Um, so we're not exactly, you know, treading any new water here, but if that's, if that's something you can use, if that's, if that's a metaphor I can use, probably not. Um, anyway, uh, what we refer to is, as the, the areas of, of major uh, emphasis here are topics, and then we have what we call areas of emphasis, which are um, the parts within those topics um, that break they can down into actionable areas. Um, these were all determined through the stakeholder review and through our um, public outreach, through our workshops, through our internal interviews. Um, these were vetted several times. We came up with this, this list of areas of emphasis that reflected what we heard from the public and what we heard from everyone else. That's the remainder of them. And the plan is organized around those. Um, it's organized the t around the 10 sustainability topics, and each chapter of the plan covers one of those topics. Um, we're going to just talk about an overview today. We're not going to be running through details in each one of these, at least as far as details of the strategies go. But we'll explain what the topics are and kind of where we're headed with the strategies. Uh, in the very first topic, I'll explain a little more detail um, the strategies to show you what that is, so what, uh, what they look like. The strategies that we came up with, we used the kind of classic strategy definition, which is how, a description of the strategy, how we do it, who leads it and supports it, what the timing is, and what the estimate of resources are to accomplish them. So the idea was to get something that's actionable that we can look at and say, here's what we need to do, how we need to do it, who's, who's going to do it, how much it's going to take to do it. And that was our basis for looking at um, whether they can be, whether they're accomplished, can be accomplished or not. As you go through the strategies, you read through the plan, you'll notice that there's an estimate of resources and they're put in FTE equivalents. Uh, I'd like to point out that those FTE equivalents don't necessarily mean new people or new resources. A lot of these things are already underway. We're accomplishing, with, accomplishing them with our existing resources. As we go along with this plan, clearly if we identify needs that require additional resources, we'd be coming back to you during budget time to explain to you what we need and why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And we bring bringing that back with a cost-benefit analysis uh, as part of our, our sustainability evaluation, even using our sustainability evaluation system, if we come up with a topic that would require that to show you why we, why we picked it. Um, so before I get into the topic specifically, do we have any questions at this point that I can answer? Okay, forge on ahead. So we'll talk about air quality. Um, air quality, uh, we had several targets. Um, they revolve around monitoring, reducing um, the ozone concentrations. That's an issue on the Front Range in recent years. Uh, front Range has exceeded, actually, ozone concentrations for several years. And there are lots of things you can do, even at a local level, to try and reduce that. So um, one of the things we're looking at is um, increasing inspections of emissions from oil and gas sites. And that actually is going to be in concert with Boulder County. Probably, you probably heard Dale and others talk about that project, where we're going to try and partner with them to try and do some of that. Um, expanding the air quality information and monitoring. We currently have um, particulate monitoring and other previous, uh, previously established monitoring in Longmont for air quality, but we really don't, don't have any ozone for this part of the front range. It's basically set in the Denver metro area. So one of the things we can do is look at expanding that, and again, in cooperation with the state or the county to try and get better ozone information to the public. Um, the other thing is to develop an ozone reduction incentive and enforcement program. Um, there are, there's money available from the Regional Air Quality Council and others to try and work on ozone precursors, which is primarily unburned fuels, hydrocarbon emissions, generally from very small engines and things like that that cause a lot more pollution than your average automobile. You know, it's reading somewhere that, you know, some of these small engines are like equivalent of a thousand Priuses or something like that. It's, you know, some of those, those kind of comparisons come around. Um, so if you can do something to reduce that, you can reduce the ozone precursor formation. Um, these are our regional efforts, obviously, between everyone along the front range, but we figured we could move ahead with some of these in Longmont to give people a better idea of what the ozone problem is and what we can do about it. Um, and to give you an example of one of the strategies, um, this is how the strategies are kind of laid out, is the, the strategy is to partner with the Regional Air Quality Council to leverage funding and program offerings. Um, one of the things they did a few years ago is a mower exchange. So you could bring in your old gasoline 
dock mower and get an electric mower in place of it. Um, and that's been resurrected. That probably will be coming back. Uh, develop educational materials and incentives for, land, for landscaping and maintenance equipment. A lot of landscapers use, still use uh, even two-stroke engines and their blowers and then their other, other equipment they use, and that's a pretty big uh, hydrocarbon source. And enforce existing anti-idling policies. The city does have an anti-idling policy. It's something we need to look at to see if it's being rigorously followed or not. Um, so who does that? Well, the lead would be us, Public Works and Natural Resources, um, support from the Regional Air Quality Council or whatever other funding sources we can find. Um, the resources that need funding are for educational materials and incentives and staffing for the program administration. Again, we're looking at that as being absorbed into existing staffing. This is not something that takes a lot of effort. It just takes somebody to work on it and pay attention to it. So those are, that's kind of an example of the details we provide in each of the strategies in the plan. Um, so move on to the next topic, which is buildings and infrastructure. Um, the targets in here are increase the number of certified buildings. We currently have five LEED certified buildings in the city. There are lots of other certifications out there other than LEED. LEED is one we have to pay for, <laughs> not necessarily something people like to follow all the time, but there's many others. Energy Star, there's one called Green Globes, which is free. Um, there's also a Green Roads program out there which has to do with transportation uh, alternatives. So there's lots of those kinds of things that we can use to um, determine whether something, something is meeting environmental alter options or not, uh, environmental objectives or not. Um, achieve more equi equitable access to transportation infrastructure. That was also part of Envision. Uh, that was part of the multimodal transportation plan in Envision. Uh, revise our design standards and construction specifications to incorporate sustainability by the end of 2018. This has been an eternal struggle in our department and others to try and get these design standards and specifications updated, so hopefully this will give us some incentive to get going on that. Um, hopefully, I, again, all city departments would be using a life cycle cost and sustainability evaluation system for our public projects. Um, we developed that as part of the public works and natural resources, but with the eye to being able to use that in other areas as well. That system includes a life cycle cost analysis which incorporates a lot of more, much more detailed cost analysis than you normally find in things that are done by consultants and others. So we're hoping to start using that to get a better idea what true costs are in projects. Uh, increase the number of participants in the owner-occupied housing rehabilitation program, something that came from our community services folks. And increase the annual amount of dedicated funding to the Affordable Housing Fund to a million dollars. And I, I think you've had presentations or discussions about that. So all these things are either kind of underway or something that we really kind of need to do, and many of them are done with existing staff and resources. So under buildings and infrastructure, um, we have expand the indoor air quality testing program, preserve, improve, and rehabilitate existing affordable homes, prioritize infrastructure improvements to ensure connectivity between underserved areas and community amenities, require life cycle cost sustainability analyses again for City of Longmont projects, revise and update the City of Longmont design standards. Did I say this already? No. <laughs> That's the same one I did. Oh, man. I read the targets. I'm sorry. Um, yes. Wake me up when it's, when it's morning, Mom. Um, so the current, <laughs> uh, one comment on this, the current um, indoor air quality program we have, we have a radon uh, monitor program at the library, which has been very popular. They're, they're kind of uh, instantaneous, not instantaneous so much as, as um, uh, radon monitors that give you a readout and you don't have to wait for weeks to get an answer. And those have been really handy to give people an idea whether they have a problem, whether they need to follow up. Uh, one of the things we were looking at to augment that program was to uh, it also provide carbon dioxide monitors, not carbon monoxide monitors, which are for fireplaces and for indoor furnaces. Carbon dioxide monitors are readily available to allow people to determine whether you have too tight of a house and whether you've got air quality issues with uh, what, 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 what you possibly have with problems with ventilation. So those are, those are something we're looking at maybe um, having at the library along with radon monitors, let people get an idea what, what's happening in their homes. So that was one of the ideas we had. Um, on the community cohesion and resilience, maybe I can get this one right. Um, the targets we have there are expand existing neighborhood programs to address neighborhood sustainability by 2017, engage more diverse members in community leadership roles at the neighborhood, local, and or regional level. So this one is really trying to work with neighborhoods in a similar model to what the programs in Denver and Lake would have done. They've energized their, their neighborhood groups to really work on sustainability initiatives and do them in themselves. And really, they have awards and they have recognition for the neighborhoods that do this. And they've really got pretty good buy-in to places that are doing things like um, community gardens, like working on walkable neighborhoods, like even doing things like having safe, safe neighborhoods. So that, those are 
kind of programs we can look at to see if we can take that same, those same ideas and take them out to neighborhoods and have them work on sustainability on their own. And can someone support this? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Hal. Thanks, um, Mayor Coombs. Going back to the last slide, um, or the last two slides, I noticed that, unless I am totally misinterpreting this, that the buildings and infrastructure, um, uh, sustainability are all targeted toward city departments uh, and city buildings. Is there anything in this plan going forward to incentivize developers to build um, green or offer sustainable things to their future residents or owners of their, of their homes like, um, I don't know, on-demand water heaters, solar, as, as options in their developments? Uh, Councilmember Peck, um, Mayor and Councilmember Peck, yeah, uh, I think that's kind of addressed in the in the um, standards and specs documentation that we're talking about. Currently, our standards and specifications are for development in general, okay, and they don't have any real sustainability-oriented uh, items in those standards. So that's something we can do is to, um, if not necessarily require them, we could at least encourage that in a more active way than we do now. Okay. So that they can look at that. So that's kind of where we think we handle that. Do you have any other places where we talked about, Lisa? Yes. Yeah. We were we were also discussing developing a guide uh, guidance document to give to development developers and others to say here's some ideas or some concepts you can use to incorporate these things into your into your buildings. Right. Okay. Yeah, and otherwise, yeah, most of these other things are oriented around city programs. We're right. trying to have city, city uh, um, work done to incorporate these ideas, yeah. So. I think we covered that one. I think to add to that question, too, one of the things we're also learning is that when folks have um, certain HUD back loans, mm -hmm. and, and it's not even the traditional... Um, it's not what you think of in terms of affordable housing, but a HUD loan in general. A lot of times they come in and put the requirements as part of that loan process too. So we've found that out within the last couple of weeks. Yeah. When we talked to the Longmont Housing Authority, one of the people we talked to in our various interviews, uh, they have those requirements as they, they get into their projects and they have to bring things up to Energy Star or some equivalent type of requirement to meet uh, energy requirements. That really helps out the lower income people because they end up paying you know, much less on their utility bills and it allows more money, as someone in the audience said, to do, spend on other things that may be more important. Uh, I think the other thing to yeah. add to that is it's, it, you know, also looking at the incentive-based approach, which is going to take us some time to pull together. Um, but we're also finding with businesses that we're working with, they're doing certain things anyway because they have other requirements that they have to hit for, if so, in some cases, if they distribute certain products, their purchaser of that product may actually put some requirements on. And so a lot of it they're doing on their own, and so that's why we were really looking at the incentive base. And one last thing on the community cohesion, the C3 strategy, which is collaborate with St. Vrain Valley School District on a preparedness and resilience site. Uh, that might need a little explanation. The idea behind that was to see if there, explore with St. Brain Valley School District if there's a place where you could incorporate energy resilience and a place for people to go when there's emergencies and things like that. So you actually would have, um, potentially have solar energy at that location, some storage of energy, ability to tap into alternative, place, alternative sources and a place to go at the same time for people when there's an emergency or an emergency repair in the situation in. Yeah, and also an educational opportunity for if you have those things in a in the school, you could use that as a school educational uh, project. So on economic vitality, uh, the targets were help businesses reduce operating costs through pollution prevention, energy efficiency, or other sustainability-related activities. Again, that's kind of that education incentive thing we're talking about and on the business end of things. Increase the number of green and, green and clean tech industries. We have, that's one of these targets we've not had a baseline defined on. We have a couple in here that we need more information on. We weren't able to get to that point um, for this plan, but that's something we'll be working on uh, as we move ahead. Increase the number of recognized sustainable businesses. Right now there's eight long-run businesses that were certified through Boulder County's PACE, Partners for a Clean Environment. That program wasn't particularly well recognized in Longmont nor particularly well accepted, <laughs> truthfully. And we feel that a local program based on recognition from Longmont itself would be more effective. So we're 
looking at, at working on that. Adopt an internal city sustainable purchasing policy by 2018. We talked to our purchasing manager about that. She had lots of great ideas uh, about what that she'd like to do and like to work on in that area. And expand business opportunities for minority owned and disadvantaged businesses. Um, again, that's a baseline that we don't have right now. We've talked to a lot of different groups about, about that, but that's something that needs to be worked on over the next, next while. Um, the one Example strategies we have on this, whoops. Um, work with local economic development organizations to attract and expand green industry and clean tech jobs. Um, create a Longmont sustainable business recognition program. Reinstate our pollution prevention program. We had a pollution prevention program years ago when EPA was pushing it pretty hard. And they had, uh, we hired someone actually to go out and discuss with businesses what they could do to be more efficient, to basically save the money is what it ends up doing. Uh, I participated in that uh, a big training that EPA had, and I worked with an, actually with a company down in the Denver area, and I myself saved them $30,000 a year by coming up with a uh, pollution prevention alternative they hadn't thought of. So things like that are out there, and we just need to re resurrect that program and get it going. Again, uh, establish and share the City of Longmont internal sustainable purchasing policy. Again, I'd like to say our purchasing manager is behind that and has some great ideas. Um, identify the needs and barriers for our disadvantaged and underrepresented businesses and uh, par partner with local educational institutions to connect sustainability knowledge and workforce needs. So that's talking about getting to both um, high school and maybe higher education to try and see what we can do to promote um, the sustainability type of topics in education that as mentioned in our audience that the, this, this new workforce, the new people coming up are actually interested in looking for when they go to cities and work, start working in communities. So, Council Member Moore. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. So, Cal, have, is there any plan in place to inventory our current um, green businesses or industries and keep track of that so we can put that in some of our marketing information? Yeah, uh, Council Member Moore and, and the Mayor, yes, there is. Um, that would be part of that pollution prevention program if we can resurrect that. And that actually can be accomplished through our existing pretreatment program. Our pretreatment coordinator deals with all the industries in town anyway, pretty much. She goes to many of them and either inspects them or works with them on all kinds of topics. So uh, that, that, that we can use that, leverage that to try and find out where they are, where our current you know, good performers are, what kind of examples there are, um, and, and, and promote that. So yeah, we have a, that's the idea behind that. I'm just thinking about manufacturers that, man, that, uh, that make LED lighting, for example, fixtures. Um, right and um, promote that as long as a center in Longmont to come here and do that. Yeah, yeah, great idea. And energy, the last one before I can go to bed, um, at least I'll take back over. Uh, the targets in this one are create uh, baseline information for greenhouse gas emissions by 2018 and maintain ongoing reporting. Decrease the utility cost burden for low-income households through energy efficiency measures. Achieve electric energy savings of 1% annually through energy efficiency measures by 2020, explore the viability of a community solar garden with PRPA, and increase annual participation in energy efficiency programs and solar installations. Um, these are all, have all been vetted through, we've talked with and vetted these through LPC and PRPA, and PRPA actually submitted a letter of support, which you probably have in your packet. Um, I think these are all doable things. Um, the goal of 1% annually is an LPC goal anyway. Um, all the PRPA communities have actually are trying to meet that goal, and I think it, it is accomplished. It can, be, it can be accomplished if we do some of these other things, too. The greenhouse gas emissions inventory has never been done for Longmont, and that's something that probably will need some consultant support to do. That's why we put it out by 2018, because we'd be coming back and talking about that with you folks. So um, I think that's it. Um, I'm trying to think of any of the strategies that need further explanation. Um, one of the things we want to do with the low-income household, household topic is to explore more options with the Colorado Energy Office and other grant and uh, funding organizations that are out there to help with that. We've, we found one, heard about one the other day, just yesterday. Um, City of Denver got a million-dollar grant um, from the feds to basically go into multifamily housing and retrofit them with energy-saving features such as insulation, LED lighting, uh, furnace upgrades, water heater upgrades, that kind of thing. And they, they partnered with a company called ICAST um, to do the actual work. And they're hoping to leverage that million dollars to retrofit approximately 3,000 multifamily units, which is a pretty good bang for your buck. Uh, the average saving that they're looking at is about 25%. 
on the energy and total energy saving in the projects that, they, that this company has already, this organization, it's a nonprofit, has worked on and has achieved uh, about 20 to 25 percent energy savings in any of the places they've worked on. So it looks like um, they're going to looking at big apartment buildings, multifamily complexes, that kind of thing. Older ones that didn't have energy features. So it's actually a pretty neat program. If you know we could pick up on something like that, it'd be great for for Longmont too, because we have so, several older facilities that could use some help. So and I will pass it on to Lisa, and she'll go through the rest Just of them. Just one quick question on the explore the viability of community solar garden yeah. with Platte River Power. Um, does it really matter whether that solar garden physically sits here in our city or, I mean, to me, once those electrons are on the grid, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, electrons are electrons and, um, you know, because they already have the, the real estate, and they've got the security, there's, so there's a lot of cost savings and benefits. You know, I see you can build, put in more megawatts of power out there than we can by buying land, building a fence, building security. So, I mean, the net result to our city would be to do it. What gives the city of Longmont the most megawatts for the least amount of dollars? And I think that's what we should pursue in this. Yeah. No, you're right. It can go anywhere. Yeah. Um, PRPA was trying to, was looking at, at identifying sites in Longmont, I think, to look at a more distributed power philosophy. Okay, yeah. Get for distributed, that's, yeah. that's a good point, yeah. too. Yeah. But they, they agree. And they're, they're building a big power field, solar field right now, as you know. Uh, right. But you're right. Those, those community fields can actually go anywhere and, right. and still get the benefit. So. It, so that actually has been part of the conversation about uh, the opportunity to increase capacity at that mm -hmm. location. Um, have even had conversations with Tom about eventually how do you incorporate it where you could buy a panel on the right in the big field because the co you get a, the economy of scale in that mm -hmm. situation versus um, doing it on, on your roof or some other place. Yeah. The other piece is is definitely the distributed power um, piece of it, but also I think they were talking about educational sites mm -hmm. in, in the communities. I think the problem is just finding one that actually right. fits. Mm -hmm. and, and close enough to a substation and all the other issues that they need. Yeah, yeah, they're looking at hopefully getting something with the with the school district that would might work. So it could right. be a combined distributed power plus the educational opportunity. Right. But it's hard to hard to pinpoint a site. So. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So we're gonna. Oh jump into food systems here. So our objective in food systems category is supporting a locally based, environmentally responsible and healthy food system that's available to all residents. Um, our targets are establishing a local uh, food storage and processing facility by 2018. And I, I just want to be clear that that's in that's something that uh, Boulder County is already pursuing that would be in partnership with Boulder County, um, most likely as part of the, the master planning efforts that are happening at the fairgrounds. So that's not looking at Longmont running a food processing facility. So just want to be um, clear on that. And also increasing access to healthy foods through a variety of initiatives such as the Harvest Bucks um, and other programs. Uh, Boulder County just received a pretty sizable grant through the USDA to help promote that program and expand it beyond farmers markets uh, to um, corner stores and other food retailers to help increase access for SNAP recipients. Um, some of our strategies are also looking at partnering with uh, local and regional partners around uh, um, agricultural research. We don't have any defined targets as yet because um, that information will will come out through that process when we have some some data to support some more specific targets. Um, but looking at things like climate smart um, agriculture practices, water conservation, energy use, soil health, things like that, um, and looking to partner with our local producers, Boulder County, and educational institutions on that those research projects. Uh, so just a couple of strategies to highlight: uh, encouraging and supporting agricultural research in Boulder County. Uh, expanding connections between local food producers and areas and populations in need, and then this establishment of a, a food processing and storage facility in partnership with Boulder County. Uh, when we met with St. Vrain Valley School District, they expressed a particular interest in partnering on that project. They're actually running out of space when it comes to food storage at St. Vrain. Uh, Boulder Valley is running into the same issue, so there's a potential to pull together some community partners um, on a on a a facility like that that would be pretty useful across the board um, and potentially be a site that that we can do cooking and nutrition education and things like that as well uh, the natural environment 
is minimizing the, the negative effects of development and human activities on natural systems by identifying, protecting, enhancing, and restoring critical environmental resources at all scales. Um, there's a target also defined and envision around maintaining and increasing uh, land for preservation and conservation efforts. Uh, but in addition, we have distributing information on water-wise landscaping and integrated pest management practices to neighborhood groups. Uh, this came out of our stakeholder outreach process because we had a lot of folks saying, why isn't the city doing this and why isn't the city doing that? And actually the city's doing quite a lot around water conservation and integrated pest management. And a lot of the issues uh, around uh, water, excessive water use are happening on private properties. And so this is actually being, us being able to showcase um, the city as a model and helping to develop some educational information to support um, residents in water-wise landscaping and integrated pest management practices. Uh, having 18% or more of our Longmont planning area covered by regionally appropriate tree canopy and vegetation by 2025. And we also have a few strategies on updating the open space master plan, uh, the wildlife management plan, and developing an ecological restoration plan. And um, again, we'll have some more specific targets once we get those plans underway, uh, specific to things like enhancing biodiversity and wildlife corridors and habitat conservation. Uh, so a few strategies to highlight is working with community partners for education and awareness, uh, updating the tree canopy management and replacement plan, um, continuing to increase participation in our existing volunteer programs. Our volunteer, pro volunteer programs are really the, the lifeblood of, of connecting our residents with natural resources. We really rely on volunteers quite a bit to do quite a bit of work. We get a lot of bang for our buck in, in terms of utilizing volunteers, um, and we really think that, that's, um, that we would like to increase participation in our volunteer programs. Um, updating. Councilmember Christensen, do you, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I just, I have one uh, small point. When you're talking about um, pesticide use and pest management, it would be also good to say herbicide and weed management because it's not the same. And both of them affect pollinators and various things. So I'm just suggesting you add that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, all right. Transportation, investing in an efficient transportation system that enhances mobility, equitably supports multiple modes of transportation, reduces environmental impacts, and supports a healthier community. Uh, we do only have one target currently listed in there. That's in part because the multimodal transportation plan and envision have um, some very relevant targets that our strategies identified in the sustainability plan support um, around uh, decreasing VMT, decreasing uh, congestion, increasing transit ridership, increasing active transportation, and, and all of that. So we, we didn't think that we needed to repeat all of the envisioned targets there, but just to call attention to the st strategies here, support those uh, targets as well, and that when we move into implementation, we'll be working in coordination with the multimodal transportation plan. Uh, a couple of strategies to highlight are looking at alternative funding streams to continue the ride-free transit program. I know you all have heard that a lot already. We heard that a lot in our stakeholder outreach process as well. So um, there's actually some interesting models um, in neighboring communities in Fort Collins in particular. They've been working with the business community there to help support their transit program. So looking and seeing what some other communities have done um, to support things like that and uh, finding alternative funding streams. So. Um. Coordinating with regional partners on publicizing car and van pooling, supportive growth in active transportation, which is bike and pedestrian um, infrastructure, and auditing transit stops to evaluate accommodation needs of all residents and making sure that our transit is um, accessible to all of our residents in our community. From the waste side, we're looking at increasing opportunities for waste diversion, education, and reuse to reduce environmental impacts. Um, these are pretty straightforward, decreasing household trash landfill to less than two pounds per day per person. Uh, we're right at about 2.2 pounds currently, or in 2015 anyway. Increasing waste diversion to 50% by 2025. Uh, right now we're at about 31%. And as all of you know, we just kicked off our composting program, and we have about 350 households signed up for that already just in the last couple of weeks, which is pretty exciting to see people jump on that and increasing internal waste diversion for city operations. Uh, 
So our strategy there are building support for the composting program, uh, developing a strategic waste management plan with regional partners. Um, a lot of the surrounding communities have similar waste diversion goals and we're gonna be losing our landfill in the not too distant future. So it makes sense to be looking to our regional partners and, and planning on that level for waste management. Um, see you. Um, one of the things that I want to highlight is adopting a commercial recycling ordinance. That's something that, that people have been asking about and I just want to, um, want to clarify that we will make sure to be working really closely with the business community on the development of that to make sure that we're developing something that is appropriate for Longmont and we would be having a lot of conversations about um, phasing in and, and options for compliance and what that would mean specific to Longmont. Uh, I did talk to the, the folks at Western Disposal who said of, a, of their current about 1,000 business customers in Longmont, about 300 or so, so about 30%, not quite 30% are already utilizing recycling services and that they've been able to uh, work with those businesses to get those costs down to be um, about equivalent to what their trash services currently are by reducing their amount of trash and diverting that through recycling. Um, increasing hazardous e-waste and materials drop-off opportunities and establishing a construction demo demolition waste incentive program. Last but not least, uh, water, preserving the natural environment in our watershed to provide a reliable, high-quality uh, water supply that protects public health. Our targets, um, and these were developed and vetted through the Water Board, and I believe you all should have a, we did just get a, a letter of an endorsement from the Water Board that hopefully you all have. Did you guys get mm -hmm. those? Yes, okay. Um, so reducing customer and city well water demands by 10% by community build out, uh, establish a comprehensive baseline of water quality conditions, um, create an active watershed management program that's really looking to build on a, a lot of the, the partners and efforts that have come together uh, in terms of flood recovery efforts uh, to really build on that momentum for broader watershed health, um, decreasing the utility cost burden for low income households through conservation measures, and continue to ensure safe drinking water for all households and Longmont's water service by addressing uh, consecutive systems. I'm gonna have Cal just explain what consecutive systems are. Yeah, I'll explain that briefly. Um, in our city and probably many other cities that don't talk about it much, we have water systems that are private and beyond a master meter. Those systems under state and federal law are called consecutive systems and the city actually has no jurisdiction over them. They are privately owned and are supposed to meet water quality within their distribution systems by themselves. So even though we get complaints from citizens and our citizens are living beyond these master meters, we do go test their water when we get complaints, but there's not anything we can do about it. Um, so we have to refer it to the actual private owner of those systems. So what my lab guy and I have been trying to figure out for a while is how we can get past that and really say all of our citizens can be part of our system and that we have some kind of jurisdiction or authority over them. Uh, I think there's some opportunities in state in the state law um, to do that, and so that's what we'd be exploring. So that's what a consecutive system is. It's a definition in the Safe Drinking Water Act. And, and Council, an example of that would be like a uh, countryside mobile home park um, where you've got a single master meter serving you know, several hundred um, housing units there. Okay, so that doesn't apply to like single family homes, it's just, okay. Um, so a few strategies to highlight in the, the water section are completing a water conservation master plan that's, that's underway currently. Um, and we're working with those folks, especially to, to share a lot of our stakeholder outreach comments around conservation. Um, so once they kind of get into that um, development of that plan, we'll be sharing all of that information with them. Um, developing a strategic water quality improvement plan for consecutive systems, as Cal was talking about, um, and looking to enhance water quality monitoring and information sharing throughout the watershed, and incorporating a watershed protection plan into the upcoming Button Rock for Forest Stewardship Plan. So that's starting to, to look at the connections between our forest health, our soil health, our watershed health, and, and to understand the connections between those. Council Member Moore. Thank you, Mary Coombs. So at least you kind of skipped over the gray water thing. Oh. Um, gray water's been in use since the 
late 70s, early 80s, in, especially in the cities in the, in the south like Arizona and New Mexico. Um, I know that it's prohibited in Longmont, but what would that take to get that uh, turned around? Okay. Mayor, Councilmember, we're all, I'll try and answer that. The state, um, through state regulation change a couple of years ago, allowed gray water system usage as long as the regulations were adopted by the local jurisdiction. Um, those regulations would primarily um, reflect the International Plumbing Code requirements now, which were, in my view, based on California's gray water requirements, which are pretty stringent. Um, in order to allow gray water in the city, uh, we would need to adopt some kind of requirement and regulation to our building code process and adopt those, those portions of the International Plumbing Code that allow gray water. Um, that would involve probably looking at what benefit there would be for the city doing that and also what kind of demand we have for gray water systems in the city. Um, as you all know, our water portfolio is pretty good. Uh, we also recycle and reuse water through various different means, including, you know, sending our wastewater downstream to be used by agriculture and things like that. So we have a pretty robust exchange program. Um, so it's a question of whether gray water would really accomplish much from a water portfolio standpoint. Now, from a consumer standpoint, if they're interested, that's a different story. Uh, but that's what it would take. It would require a code change, adoption of the International Plumbing Code, which, by the way, requires treatment of the gray water before you can use it in anything. So it requires filtration and disinfection before you can actually use it, and that requires a system that had to be, would have to be maintained by the homeowner or the business or whoever's doing great water recovery. So, thank you. Sure. Okay. So, looking at kind of moving forward, uh, we have ju just a snapshot of our immediate strategies. So, as we've mentioned, there's already quite a bit of work underway, uh, but there's a lot of work that we still have to do, and there's a lot that we can initiate in 2017, largely uh, with existing resources, um, as is in the proposed 2017 budget. So I'm uh, just kind of giving you an idea that we're really ready to, to hit the ground running. So, um, And then looking forward into implementation and plan, plan maintenance, um, these are pretty important components of making sure uh, that our, the implementation of our sustainability plan is successful. And so we're looking to incorporate a pretty robust monitoring and evaluation program to ensure that we're adequately tracking our progress and that we're effectively utilizing uh, the resources to meet our goals. Uh, utilizing the sustainability evaluation system, which we've already talked about quite a bit, but to more objectively evaluate projects and programs. And again, emphasizing that that um, tool includes a life cycle cost analysis so that we can look at both the, the financial aspect of things and the other um, potential costs and benefits involved in any project that we're looking at and so that we can really make an informed decision moving forward of, of what we might be looking to spend, what we might be looking to gain and other auxiliary benefits um, and, and using that as a tool to make those decisions. Uh, coordination with it, the implementation of Envision. Um, getting ongoing input from a sustainability advisory committee. We've had a uh, pretty strong desire from community members, as you've heard tonight, that folks are really interested in continuing to be part of this process as we move forward into implementation. Uh, we think that that's really important in terms of creating greater impact within the community. It's also an opportunity for us as a city to leverage the skills and resources within the community to really get a lot of this work done and really focus on building those community partnerships so that we can get this done together. Uh, sustainability coordinator to manage sustainability efforts and make sure that the implementation of the plan is successful. Looking at an annual review and modifications as needed with reporting to city council and the community on an annual basis and a formal update every five years. So we're really looking for this plan to be a living document. The field of sustainability is, is an ever-changing one and there's always new tools and technologies that we can use to further our sustainability goals. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank you all for your, for your time tonight. Uh, we're pretty fortunate that previous uh, Longmont City Councils have had some, some foresight to um, make planning decisions in the past, particularly around our water resources, as Cal was talking about, and have forward-thinking actions um, that we're benefiting from today and will continue to benefit from um, far into the future. And this is your, really your opportunity for those of you sitting here today to do that as well and really plan for a sustainable and resilient Longmont not only today, but for future generations as well. So. Well, I would like to say that's, that was an excellent presentation. 
um, did a lot of work and uh, your presentation was, was great. Um, I don't have any, I have one small comment. You don't have to put it in your sustainability plan, but last, I think it was about two weeks ago, I was talking to a uh, sod farmer that creates, um, you know, grasses and stuff, and they've developed some sort of blend of uh, native fescue grasses that they've actually used now in some golf courses up in Wyoming. And, they, you know, the advantage of those grasses are they take significantly less water, less fertilizer, and less mowing. So maybe there's some things like that we can investigate and try to encourage, you know, homeowners or, or whatnot to use something else that uses a lot less water and takes less mowing and, you know, is more drought resistant and more insect resistant and um, disease resistant. So yeah, just, a, just a comment. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Uh, thank you, Lisa, Cal, and um, I'm sorry I didn't get your name. Shelby. <laughs> you did an excellent job. Um, I do have one request, though, and you probably have already uh, thought of this. Do you have a smaller, this is a pretty big document to hand out to businesses or like a trifold or are, are you coming up with anything like that? Yeah, I, I mean, right as it stands right now, we have the summary document that was handed out, which is, which is about mm -hmm. as short as I could get it for, for this purpose. Um, but as part of that communications pl marketing and right. outreach, the grant that we got, we're working on a communications plan. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, so we are working on a communications plan. Um, I wanted to point out there is a, a brief executive summary already in the plan, which is about five to six pages. Um, but part of the communications plan includes um, various tactics and messaging for different audiences. So what does this mean if you're a um, residential um, or a resident of Longmont or a business owner or um, even a city staff member? What does this plan mean for you and um, some general communication points to, to move forward? So, yes. That's great. It, it would be great to have something that realtors could hand out uh -huh. that um, that planning and zoning could give to developers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Member Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I have a couple of questions. How many other cities have adopted a formal sustainability plan like this? Uh, I don't know that I could in Colorado answer the specific number. Uh, let's see. Like I could start to count, <laughs> start to count them. Yeah, do you I, have an idea? I would say at least on the dozens level. Um, okay. Along the North Front Range, I can think of um, a handful of communities that have addressed sustainability more directly in their comprehensive plan. So it's a hybrid document. Um, Fort Collins is one. Um, I'm thinking of a number of communities that also parse out their sustainability plan. So they'll have a specific energy element. They'll have a food element, a water element. Um, so. Complete packages like this, I would say maybe a dozen or so. Um, Lakewood is one that comes to mind as being sort of a, a similar example um, and relatively similar demographics mm -hmm. to Longmont, um, but I know there are many others. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Lakewood frequently uh, is on the forefront of new things. Um, ozone regulations, I know that there is a rulemaking hearing for ozone SIP revisions that's coming up very soon. And I also know that the new, uh, there's a newly finalized 2015 ozone requirement to meet at, at 70 parts per billion. Mm -hmm. So we might want to think about that as we look at the ozone stuff. That's, that's a moving thing and, and it's some, some changes are going to be happening very shortly. So uh, you might want to, uh, pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, when I first thought about the sustainability plan, my biggest concern was that we'd be codifying uh, regulations that would kind of strap us and make us less flexible in attracting new business. Um, I don't see that here yet, and I hope I don't. Um, I hope that we keep in mind that we need to have that flexibility and use the carrot instead of the stick when it comes to those things. Um, you talked about updating design standards and construction specs, but I didn't see any builders or uh, developers on that list of people who are in your group. Uh, so if you're going to 
change everything they have to do, you might want to include them in that. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to really be inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, uh, you talk about a commercial, a commercial recycling ordinance. Once again, I would rather see a carrot instead of a stick on that uh, because that, those are things that will affect the perception of our community mm -hmm. as being less business friendly. Yeah. And that's what I don't want to <laughs> see. I ha like I say, I haven't seen it in this, but it could. There are some things, some red flags in this that, yeah. that still you know, have the little hairs on the back of my head stand sure. up. So just be aware of those things. Yeah. Uh, I do great a, work, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do want to highlight that we did get feedback from uh, Bruce Bertain, who's the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, um, who said that he also didn't see anything that looks like undue burden for business, and he really thought the effort was pretty commendable from the city's perspective, and also highlighted that that even if something does come up in the future, a development project that might be in conflict, that um, that he's had faith that we could address it at that time. And I think we've worked really hard to get a broad base of support for this plan. So when those things do come up, that we can we can have those conversations. We can use the tools like the sustainability evaluation system and really uh, make the de the decision that's best for our community. And Councilmember from the Mayor, um, I'd like to add that there are examples out there that we can use certainly for things like the waste diversion, like the waste diversion requirements. Um, some places give uh, permit fee reductions, uh, or they give a facilitated approval process uh, for for development that that uses those kinds of practices. So those are incentives you can use to try and help that. Councilmember Christensen. Um, just to comment on uh, the other towns, I think we are, I, I know that Lyons has a sustainability plan, Nettleton has a sustainability plan, I believe Jamestown does, Boulder does, I think Lafayette and Louisville do too, so I think we're probably, you know, the only one in the county but uh, that doesn't have one. So I, I think this is a, a really very detailed plan. <laughs> As I was waiting through it, I thought. <laughs> but um, so I would like to um, um, be supportive of what Councilman Peck said. We need a smaller plan. And what I like about this one, and I like what I liked about the previous one that Cal was involved with, it is that it uh, the shorter version emphasized um, what individuals could do, businesses and individuals could do to right now, and it also it celebrated what this, uh, the government and the businesses and the individuals in this town have already done and are in the process of doing. And, and so I think that's uh, what would be good for the a communication thing, both mm -hmm. on a, a website version and a, a printed version for various people. Um, and I, I really, I like the way that this um, reinforces envision and helps us move forward in a more cohesive way. I think it, it was fortuitous timing. Um, of course, the flood kind of made us have to do a lot of rethinking, so, you know, there's an upside. <laughs> um, I also would like the business model to be made for this because it, the, the strongest thing about the Boulder County um, plan is that it says, and this comes from data, for every dollar you invest in these efforts, you get five dollars back. That's the ultimate reason why we're doing. I mean, that's not the only reason, but this is, this is. If we think forward, it's just like our personal lives. You have to invest in something long term, and you do get your money back. But it seems, uh, it, you know, we put it off and put it off. If we don't put it off and we just, you know, march forward we're actually going to be saving people of various incomes a lot of money and also our businesses and that's what we want and, and have a better world for our kids. Um, I, I would like to make one comment about, we, we have um, a lot of people who would like to participate in some of these things. I had a home audit. I think most people have had these, a lot of people have had the audit and then that's where they get stuck because they, I know I need insulation, I know I need a new furnace, I need a new roof, and I need radon mitigation, but all I am offered really is loans, and I, most people cannot 
take on any more debt. So if we could find ways to get more grants, maybe on a federal level, that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, anyway, that's all I actually wanted to say. And, and thank you very much for all the hard work you guys have done. Thank you. Do you want to turn your mic off? Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, I think do we, uh, you're expecting us to basically approve this plan, which I think we... Not tonight. Not We're tonight. asking okay. for direction. Just if direction you want us to, to bring, bring it forward. Any changes, any amendments, then we to bring back to you for okay. the formal approval process. One of the things I did want to add is when um, Lisa was um, presenting this to the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, um, they did touch on some of the economic pieces. And, and what they focused on was looking at economic sustainability as a component of the overall analysis, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally built in the model that um, in public works where we look at those pieces um, because some of the members were saying if it's not economically sustainable for me to do it, that creates a different issue. Mm -hmm. And wanted to say that is built in the model that we have and we want to make that model available to folks. So they can use that as an evaluation tool. And, and we're going to use it, well, we are using it um, in, when we look at different projects and you adjust those variables to see what makes the most sense and what is the optimal configuration of the project to, to achieve all of the aspects of sustainability without sacrificing one where you create a different situation for yourself. Well, I know people, business owners, particularly are, are motivated by profit and payback. And I, I know like when we replace all the EC motors and all of our HVAC system, um, you know, that paid for itself in less than a year. It was amazing. You know, you go to that refrigeration room, you used to draw about four amps, and when they changed out the motors, it was down to a half of an amp. And then, you know, the LED lighting, um, that was kind of a no-brainer. And not only do you save on the lighting costs, but then because they don't burn out, you don't have busboys going up 14-foot ladders, changing out so your workman's comp risk and other things and labor because you don't have to, ch you know, we haven't had a single LED bulb, I think, burn out in two years yet <laughs> since we did that. So, you know, I think if you educate businesses on the advantages of some of these technologies, they, you know, if they're good businessmen, they'll jump all over it because it will save them money. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. The other piece I wanted to point out, too, on the question on the code changes, you know, we do that when we do the code revisions um, with, um, with building, um, and they get folks together. What we're really finding is those code revisions at the national level incorporate a lot of this, um, but there is conversations with everyone as we move into that process. Okay. Or there are. Councilmember Christensen? Um, I was wondering why um, the only air quality that gets mentioned mostly is ozone, why we're not talking about um, CO2 and methane as well. Um, we, you know, we don't want to monitor every cow, and they do provide a lot of methane, but. <laughs> um, no, we do. Some of the strategies are expanding monitoring and information not just focused on ozone, but other air quality measures as well. And a lot of that is changing now um, with some of the requirements that are coming down, some of the new standards that are coming down, looking more specifically um, at methane and other particulate matter and things like that. Yeah, and then we the the GHG inventory is, is is will be another kind of component of that. Yeah, Shelby, did you want to? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. That was, that was outstanding. Let's take a five minute break. <laughs> <laughs>
seats and resume our meeting. I'm sure Sheena would like to get home to her family. <laughs> so let's, let's take our seats and resume the meeting, please. The next item on your agenda is a proposed wellness incentive changes and Sheena Campbell, our wellness coordinator, is here to present. Mayor Coombs, council members, thank you for letting me be part of this tonight. My name is Sheena Campbell. I'm the wellness coordinator here with the city of Longmont. Um, and we have some changes to the wellness incentive program that we really think could uh, make it better and really help decrease some of the lifestyle diseases that we're seeing um, plague our people, which increase our health insurance costs. So let's start with a little bit of the history of the wellness program. Um, it's been in place for over 20 years informally. It started in risk management, which is where I, um, I'm housed out of currently. And it started just as informal health challenges, um, different education that were part of health and safety training. In 2009, it was um, approved that the Wellness 130 incentive was brought forward, that if you complete different pieces of your wellness journey, that you would um, earn $130 as a rebate at the end of the year. 
Uh, the things that make up that wellness incentive um, are up there on your screen. You have to earn four wellness points by completing wellness classes or challenges, be up to date on your biometric and preventative cancer screenings, and then complete a total health assessment, which is an online health risk questionnaire. So this is the program that's been in place and has been since um, it was approved. So we have data from 2010 here before you. Um, and looking at this, you can see that participation in the program has basically plateaued, uh, gone up a little bit here and there. Um, and then our 2016 data is still to be determined as the end of the wellness year is October 31st. So that data is coming in and will be here soon. Um, so when the wellness advisory team and I were looking at this data and looking at it through time, we were wondering uh, why has it plateaued? Is there something better we can do? Uh, so first we looked at feedback from employees. Um, what is either encouraging you to participate or what is holding you back from, from participating and completing the program? And most of the um, things that we heard were around time and commitment. That uh, going to a one-hour cooking class was the same as um, we're the same amount of points as doing a bike challenge for an entire month where we have people um, similar to the mayor and other people in this room who rode over 500 miles. So riding 500 miles on their bike is much different than going to a one-hour cooking class. And so we thought, maybe. I mean, it depends on the person, right? Um, so we thought, um, what can we do to better um, encouraging those things that are truly daily lifestyle choices that you pick and not just a, a quarterly class that you attend and may or may not implement? So then we looked at the research as well. The um, Centers for Disease Control, the American Heart Association, their recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate activity a week. So we've kind of based this program on that, of getting that minimum to combat those lifestyle diseases, heart disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, those things that it's been proven to reduce your risk of if you incorporate those and do the minimum of 150 minutes a week. Um, and then um, also healthy eating. No surprise, healthy eating and active living are what keep us healthy. Um, so it, it's great. It's great that it's not something taboo and crazy that we can't get a hold of. So um, that's what the program is centered around is those two things healthy eating, active living, and what you can do on a daily basis to choose healthy things in your life. So our proposal is for people who track this and complete um, on average 150 minutes a week um, of exercise or healthy eating equivalent that they would be able to earn a day off. Um, for their efforts, it's been shown that people who exercise and eat right on a regular basis, their productivity at work is higher. Um, they are also happier, they also sleep better, um, and then those lifestyle diseases and a couple types of cancer are also kept at bay. So if you guys do approve, it would uh, require an ordinance change and we would bring that forward at uh, a future council meeting. Um, that's why we're bringing it forward to you tonight to see um, what your thoughts are on that. And do you, any of you have any questions? Well, I see any questions, but I've got some comments. I, I totally agree with everything you're presenting here because, you know, I, I lived a half healthy lifestyle. And, um, you know, I know it works. I mean, it got mm -hmm. me off prescription meds. It got me off heart, um, blood pressure meds and satins. And, uh, you know, I feel like a million dollars. So I don't understand why everybody doesn't want to feel as good as I do. So, but anyway, I'll get off my... <laughs> um, yeah, I do think, though, that um, you're on the right track that, you know, basically I agree that going to a cooking class is not the same as exercising. <laughs> Although, um, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thankful that my wife is such an excellent cook. And, uh, you know, we just eat because it'd be really, really hard for me to... <laughs> eat the way I do if I had to do it all, my, all on my own. So, uh. Yeah, so a couple of things that I wanted to point out as well. If you, if you saw the increase in 2012, so one of the things, the, so they've, they've tried incremental strategies. Um, so in conversations with Sheena, I think it was in 2012, um, we sort of changed the approach instead of a passive approach in, in the, the projects and having classes. Sheena actually started going with, um, I think at that time it was Doug, mm -hmm. to the safety training meetings um, and really talking to folks. And so through that engagement at the work site, we actually saw that increase. But as you can see, it, it 
pretty you know 12 percent increase in 2013 and then it plateaued again and so we were really trying to look at this they also i mean part of this is also a restructuring of the overall incentive and do you want to go over that really quick with them um yeah i believe it's in the communication so um part of the what the team um came up with is that 130 instead of it having to be an all or nothing is to have it be that their points that they can get to get people engaged at a lower level that might not be as far along on their wellness journey that those points wellness points do get a reward for that so it's just breaking up the same reward we have currently into two separate sections so there'd be um, a section where you earn fifty dollars for completing those things that you do learn skills it is important to learn how to cook right it can serve you really great in life um, and if you keep building on stuff like that. So there is a purpose to it. And then the part that's the, the next tier, um, that if you completed those as well as your screenings and total health assessment, you would then get the extra $80 to complete that $130. So a slight change in that program, but looking at how can we engage more people where they're at currently in their wellness journey. So my one question is, um, the benefits that the city gets is healthier, employees employees which may probably make them more productive and then a decreased cost in our health insurance health costs, insurance costs. Yes, so even correct. though we're paying them we get more money back from what we're paying out is it's kind of the theory right yeah um, just like you said you feel like a million bucks when you take care of yourself I think it's based on that when you feel good you do better at your job and you're able to give more of yourself on a regular basis I think the other piece and that's why the metabolic um, panel um, is such a big point because that's also, um, you know, early diagnosis and where you can become, you can get into the preventative um, treatment process um, to avoid things. So for blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of those issues. So the metabolic panel was, was a significant point for us. Um, and that's actually where it, when you actually get that indication, then you start on the other pieces yeah. to help reduce your um, potential you don't you never eliminate it but it reduces the potential ultimately hopefully reducing your insurance costs the other piece is actually um, and you don't talk a lot about it in this arena but it's also the use of sick leave and so what what you see is when folks engage in this you actually dramatically reduce the sick leave which is a tremendous savings to the organization um, and increases the productivity as well mm -hmm. You know, I'd also like to say you don't have to be, you know, a super competitive athlete to be healthy. I mean, just a 15-minute walk, mm. you know, every day. I mean, when you, when I travel to, like, Washington, D.C., and you see people take the metro, and it's just kind of anecdotal evidence, but most people that tr use public transportation, when they get off that train, they have to walk six blocks. Mm -hmm. And they're still walking six blocks both ways at both ends. And you see, physically can see the difference in cities that have public transportation and cities that don't have good public transportation. It's because people are walking. So. Council Member Moore. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. So I guess um, I didn't see this in the communication, but does this program extend to the families of employees as well? Because, I mean, that would directly benefit our health insurance as well. Mayor Coombs, uh, Council Member Moore, thanks for your question. Um, it does not currently extend to the family members on the plan. Um, it just is the employees. Yeah, well, I just, you know, it might be something to think about as an expansion because, you know, maybe that would get somebody off yeah. um, the couch eating potato chips and not go out and mow the yeah. lawn or something instead. And it's been shown that people who have a team behind them do a little better. So yeah. that's definitely something we can look at. Actually, the family piece has been something we've talked about um, in our team meeting. And they can use a real lawnmower that you push. <laughs> Council Member Christensen. Um, Mayor, I believe that most people who have to take the bus or public transportation are usually running six blocks each way. That's <laughs> what I usually do. But, um, so I had two questions. Um, how much does this cost the city, this program cost the city per year currently? Um, Mayor Coombs, can you explain, are you asking like how many people currently complete it and the cost to us? Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have approximately 227 people, actually exactly 227, okay. who completed it last year at $130 each. Oh, okay. That's a good investment. So, um, the, and the other question is, 
uh, with the screening, um, do they screen for diabetes? Okay, that's that would that's a really helpful thing because you can often if you just you know that you're pre-diabetic you can offset it and so that it, you don't develop it and that's a very expensive mm -hmm. problem for the whole country. So actually, and they use the a H1C, A1C, A1C. Yeah. Um, which it takes that longer look at at it and so. We, we actually had questions about that because we saw our numbers shift from where they use the traditional versus the A1C, and it's just because it it looks back how many? It's like three months that it, it looks, looks back, back on instead months. of just the current day. So we just Are need direction from count. I mean, um, if, if the direction I, is I to think bring we, this you know, back. If, if if this is going to be a more effective program, which it sounds like it is, then we should move to what's going to affect the most people and give the city the biggest bang for the buck and give us the healthiest employees. So we, we will bring this back then in terms – it has to be an ordinance because of where it exists today. We will bring that back to you okay. all. Is everybody in agreement? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I guess now it's time for uh, mayor and council comments. Councilmember Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I was glad to see Strider back. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, welcome back, Strider, but he, he left already. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's all I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'd, I'd like to say that, um, you know, the ballots are being mailed out. It's all a mail-in ballot, and if you haven't registered yet, you just go to www.iwillvote.com, and you can register, or you can change your address, or whatever you need to do to uh, make sure you vote. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, yes, and you can also check to make sure that you're going to get a ballot. I forget what the website is for that. Um, I just wanted to mention that this week, uh, over the weekend, the uh, Congregational Church had a um, workshop, uh, a two-day workshop on um, racism and uh, prejudice, and it was very, very useful. It was uh, very helpful for us to think about all the ways that we kind of uh, marginalize people, and I think all of us do this from time to time, and it's just uh, helpful to think about the way we speak, the way we treat people, um, and the way oh, the results of our society when people don't get a fair shot. That's, to me, that's why my father came here, is to get a fair shot. That's why a lot of people, what people are proud of in America is that we like to think we have the opportunity to earn a good place for ourselves uh, through our own hard work. and. When people aren't don't have equality of opportunity and justice, it uh, bends us away from what America is about. So uh, I want to thank the Congregational Church for initiating that. It was a very nice event. Okay, anybody else? Well, I did, would like you to mention that. Um, you know, everybody probably notices that Brian Bagley's been missing, and his uh, father, I guess, was uh, able to get a heart donated tonight. So he's on a plane back to um, Arizona. So hopefully we'll uh, keep him in our prayers. And um, Yeah, so, so it'll be good to get him back. All right, city manager, any comments? No comments, Mayor Council. City Attorney, any comments? No comments, Mayor. Okay, this meeting is adjourned.